Welcome back to Sunless Skies. In the last episode, we looked at all of the factions around Pan and then headed down to Ackles. And that's where we're picking up. I have not explored Ackles in the slightest, so let's explore it. An illicit haven of tea and spices, glowing gently in the darkness of a poisonous marsh. Sweet scents drift down from the market above, soon lost in the noxious fumes. How does anybody live here? Isn't everybody just getting poisoned all the time? From the fumes, if nothing else? The floating market. Rotting wooden huts on stilts stretch up out of the marshland, connected by rickety walkways and gently swaying rope bridges. Red paper lanterns line the paths, offering just enough flickering light to avoid unfortunate tumbles into the dark mud below. Ringbreaker urchins in colander helmets and tea tray armor stand to slack attention, longing for a little trouble. They also have colander helmets. Just like the people like colander helmets. Uh, oh, actually, that was when we first came to Ackley's. Uh Didn't explore it, but we had an event that we had to go through where uh, a bunch of people were trying to like bust down the door of a monastery. Who are these colander helmeted people? Oh, so much to do. Uh, this is the Court of Tea and Spices. The bulk of the market is devoted to brews and incense and the almost priceless Midnight's Favor. Every breeze carries a different scent. <clears throat> Clouds of rich scents hang in the air. Though the market is small, it's bustling with both London and native Eleutherian traders. Each cramped stall and barrow is piled high with the region's finest tea leaves, opiates, salts, and spices. Oh my god, there's so much to do. I love this. Browse the tea barrows. Many of the spice merchants have tattoos on their left cheek, denoting what they sell. The Londoners present have yet to adopt the tradition. Yeah, wait, I'm sorry, what the heck? Is their stock so locked down and they're so sure that they're going to sell these exact things for the, like, basically the whole entire rest of their lives that they tattoo the menu on their face? Huh. Although this port is mostly famed for its homegrown Midnight's Favor, it's quickly becoming a trade hub for every flavor and blend of tea you could possibly wish for. Customers don't brew them, but bite into the leaves and lick samples off their fingers. Biting tea leaves, that sounds unpleasant. I've never done it before. Ask about Midnight's Favor. Stories say it's blacker than night and tastes even deeper. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rarest of delicacies. Your inquiries draw little but averted eyes and apologies that they're not worthy of Midnight's Favor. The select few who trade in it consider it far too precious to simply sell. I could purchase some tea in bulk. I'm sorry, is this going to cost me five otherworldly artifacts? And 320 sovereigns? That's a lot of otherworldly artifacts. But I do like tea. Sure. Oh, that's weird. It only actually took one otherworldly artifact, but I needed more than that. Fighting down the price. You do your best to trade with the merchants and agree a fair price. Slightly fair or much fair, you can only guess and hope. Oh, maybe it's random how well you haggle them down. If you haggled really poorly, maybe you'd have to give them all the otherworldly artifacts. Anyway, five caddies of dried tea. Sweet. I don't have room for that. Hmm. Well, we'll deal with that later. Visit Murgatroyd's Taste of Albion. I think we have a quest for something here. Yeah. Clay Conductor. There's so much to do, I'm just exploding, I think, with... It's just... Ugh, there's like a million different options just within Murgatro uh, Murgatroyd's Taste of Albion. From the top down. Um, oh, we should read this first. Although one of the more professional-looking barrows in the market, the Murgatroyd family's special tea blends have gained little traction. Proprietress Amberly Murgatroyd glares at you from behind a slender cigarette holder, twitching at the inconvenience of your presence. Hmm. 
Hmm, I can only imagine why they're not selling very well. Pay to let the clay conductor spend time with Amberly's assistants. He is eager to speak to the clay men in her employ. I didn't even look at the price. How much was it? 300 sovereigns. Echoing across the marsh. Just don't let him give them any ideas, Amberly tells you. The clay conductor requests that they sing for him. The other clay men look reluctant, embarrassed even, but one with shale skin steps forward. It has been too long, but we should still sing. Following his lead, the clay men launch into a mournful, hollow aria that resonates within your ribcage. Even Amberly Murgatroyd shivers as the last notes die away. The clay conductor is quiet for a long minute. At last, he gives his verdict. No. He stomps away, back towards your engine. They are very picky, but we'll find it. We'll find the right person for you. Um, I can't actually go speak with the officers right now. So I'll just finish this up then. Speak with Amberly Murgatroyd. There are many fellow Am uh, Albioners this far into Eleutheria. A short chat. Are you here to buy? Amberly glances around, looking for a distraction. If you're not here to buy, I don't know why you're here, unless... She sizes you up. Perhaps. Perhaps. Sounds like an opportunity in the offering. Amberly lights a fresh cigarette. I'm sure you've heard of Midnight's Favor. It's all anyone wants around here. Well, I have plans to deal with that. Were you to assist me when the moment presents itself, well, I would be most grateful. In a most profitable way for us both. Okay. I. When am I going to be called on for that favor? Guess it'll just pop up at some point. Ask about Sigrid and the urchins. The urchins seem young to be in a position of authority. Didn't somebody during the fight or whatever that was uh, at the monastery when I first came here? Didn't one of them say like for Sigrid? They like cry that as their battle cry or something? Fingers squeezed white, white around a cigarette holder. That little scrod and her infernal playmates. Amberly shakes her head. I'd blame the parents if she'd had any. No discipline. A few damn good spankings never did me any harm. The day's youth could do with getting to know the back end of a slipper. Just look at my sister, Melisine. I met them. At Lustrum. Yeah. No. Don't spake your children. That's abuse. Inquire about the family business. The Murgatroyd Company is known for more than tea and crackers. There's little you cannot learn in their salons for the right price. A more specialized branch of the family tree. Amberly looks at you with disdain. Oh, please, even if I had time for Father Spymaster games, exactly how much do you think one overhears on the edge of nowhere? She takes a long, pointed drag from her cigarette. Honestly, if you must waste someone's time with such nonsense, go annoy my sister, Melisine. I think we stashed her somewhere in the Reach. Her and her ridiculous inventions. Yes, I'm sure she's nothing better to do than listen to you. Purchase a caddy of tea. At these prices, it's no wonder the stall is so quiet. How much is it? 90 sovereigns for one caddy? Nah, I'm good. Return to the market. Let's ask about Midnight's favor again. See if anything different happens, perhaps. Hmm, nope. Visit the Midnight Garden. Steps lead up to a wooden temple, landscaped with flowers and gravel. Not just anyone is welcome. Mere money will not grease the wheels. Oh, I unlocked this with affiliation with Bohemia too. Nice. The noise of the market slowly fades as you follow the rickety wooden steps down to the marsh. Bohemians, calling themselves Midnight Connoisseurs, have built a wooden pagoda overlooking the monastery to savor the taste of the leaves that grow within. Oh, is that where the midnight, the midnight 
uh, what was it called? Midnight something? Um, is that where it's grown within the monastery? And is that why people were trying to break down the door to get in there? They wanted the tea or whatever it is. I'm not actually sure what it is. Ask the midnight connoisseur about the tea. How good can it be? Can it be to be worth so much trouble? A gasp of shock. You would even ask in this place so close to its presence. The midnight connoisseur stares at you coldly from behind their teacups. Right, that's not helpful. Sure, attend a tea ceremony then. We'll figure it out with experience. I unlocked this with a Connoisseur of Fine Teas 3. Where did I gain this? Was this gained when I sampled all the teas at uh, Murgatroyd's place in Lustrum? An Honored Guest. Midnight's Favor, that's what it was called. The ritual comes easily to you. It begins with a cup of mere hot water, sipped to clear the taste buds. Midnight connoisseurs bring forth a bowl of embers on which to heat the ceremonial bronze kettle. You wait, eyes averted from the kettle so that, that it may boil <laughs> while your host prepares the implements. The silver spoon, the receptacle of milk, to be turned down politely in accordance with both, both taste and tradition. A small chocolate biscuit, perched aside the saucer to be greeted with a classic mantra, Oh, lovely. And devoured in no fewer than three bites that leave behind no trace of crumb. You've sampled Midnight's favor. Finally, the tea is poured. It carries the taste of lost love, with a bitter aftertaste of the happiness that came before. The first sun of spring and the last bell of Christmas. That is the first sip. It's customary to wait at least five minutes before taking a second. Something calls to you. You feel it in your head. It stirs through your memory, sifting for every forgotten pain, every pang of guilt, every regret that ever rose unbidden. Midnight's call. The host remains silent. You continue drinking your tea. After the last drop is gone, sleep comes easily and comfortably. For a moment, the world seems no less cruel, but endlessly more endurable. Something in the back of your mind caresses the bad memories, and soon they melt away into pleasant dreams. Well, that's nice. I guess that's why people like it so much. Midnight's favor. Caresses the bad memories, and soon they melt away into pleasant dreams. Briefly without terror. You awaken on a soft patch of leaves and fungus staring up at the high monastery walls from inside. There's no roof, just a gaping hole from which you can just glimpse Eleutheria's black sun carving its increasingly familiar hole in the heavens. Your head throbs, not the pain of a headache, but something deeper. The sense of something digging for something. Regrets, mistakes, thorned vines twisting deep into your darkest memories. Pull yourself up. There's only one exit from here. The walls are too slick to climb. where midnight holds lease. The call comes from deeper in the monastery. Knee-high ruins mark the echoes of buildings that have long since given way at a time. Vines stretch everywhere, pushing through masonry and lying strewn across the makeshift paths. A handful of silent monks wearing animal masks tend the glistening fields of fresh tea. Some water, some pick. All ignore you as you stumble around them, under siege from old regret. Little remains of this place, but its high walls and the outline of ancient chambers and lingering glass and stone. Gaps and crystal lenses in the wall help focus the limited light in a way that suggests a glorified greenhouse. With the ground thick with strata of dead flora, packed as hard as concrete, masked monks in hempen robes move unhurriedly about, tending to fields of tea in the ruins. So before I continue, I just want to mention just want to talk about Midnight's Favor. It sounds... It sounds quite dangerous. Pleasant to begin with, but then when you come out of the... I, I guess high is not really the right term. When you come out of its comfort, 
all the bad memories come back even harder than they were before. That's bad. Attempt to talk to one of the monks. Each group tending a field wears a different mask. A fox, a rabbit, a wolf. They hum in unison, an atonal melody that still echoes somewhere in your aching head. Silence. The monks ignore your presence. They water the tea. They pick the tea. They place the tea in baskets for other monks to collect and convey to the port. Attempt to remove one of the masks? Ooh. Uh, hmm. That is extremely rude, but... I can't say I'm not curious. Oh, that's probably going to result in something real bad. Mm. God, Elizabeth's curious, though. Oh, she's real curious. The monk barely reacts as you lift up the mask. Underneath, there's simply a human face. Calm, at peace. No vines flowing from empty eye sockets. No hideous, wilted skin that must be hidden from the world. The monk regards you with a placid look and lowers the mask, resuming his humming in his work. That was surprising. Completely uneventful. Should I sample the tea this fresh? Sure. Good way to understand it is to try it even more. A time to sample. Each field's workers bear their own masks, and the tea each group grows has its own distinct color. They do not object to you picking a couple of leaves for yourself. Wolf tea, fox tea, rabbit tea. Hmm. So the wolf tea, its leaves are the darkest, glittering softly. The fox tea has red leaves, browning as they grow. And the rabbit tea has a dark green leaf edged with purple. Let's sample the fox tea. You place the tea leaf on your tongue. The taste of ash, of words unsaid, the cold corpse in the bed, beyond recrimination or apology, the guilt of the abuser's silent partner, their crime being the choice to look away again and again until ignorance was no longer a blanket, every last word set in anger, and every naive conceit that regret owes anyone a second chance. The whispers of what could have been curled up in the darkness of midnight and drowned by its depths. That sounds horrifying. Well, that definitely isn't the blend. Well, I, I guess it isn't a blend. That definitely isn't the type of tea that we tried. There's nothing comforting about that at all. Let's sample the wolf tea. Leaves are the darkest. Place the tea leaf on your tongue. Fire. Cold fire. The predator. The stalker. The final drink at the end of a long night. The click of the lock. The control of stick and rope, the rush, the cold that follows, a hatred turned inwards, an escape into midnight where sins are absolved, the wolf muzzled, never to hunt again, the wolf lashed in the darkness, growling and awaiting its chance to break free. That could have been what we tried, maybe, where sins are absolved, an escape into midnight. The rabbit tea, dark green leaf edged with purple. Bitterness. A twisted heart. A train pulling away from a station for want of the right word at the wrong time. The ashes of a flame that burned away everything that mattered. A true love's kiss seen shared with another. The fear that paralyzes. The fear that welcomes the darkness. The darkness of midnight, where disappointment has no lease. Let's continue through the monastery. The vines stretch onwards into a bell tower. It's one of the few recognizable structures remaining. The keep. All the vines seem to converge here. You enter the darkness inside and climb up the crumbling, rickety steps. Bits of rock and loose pebbles rattle down the stairs behind you, and you're forced to press against the masonry to avoid losing your step. When you reach the top, 
even the low light of the bell tower is suddenly blinding. The writhing light of the sun obscured by an immense black-leaved plant. A midnight plant. Its black and purple leaves drink in the light. Its green vines pulse, spreading throughout the monastery. The floor is ankle deep in a mulch of fallen leaves, winking with the odd radiant flower. Your head pounds, your memory paging through pain and regret faster than demented... Zoetrope? What's a zoetrope? Oh, a zoetrope is, is one of several pre-film animation devices that produce the illusion of motion by displaying a sequence of drawings or photographs showing progressive phases of that motion. That's... I don't think that's a great explanation, but uh, Google a zoetrope and you'll probably recognize it. The midnight plant rustles, its flowers puckering for a moment. It extends a vine, thorned, bloodied. Hmm. This plant deeply scares me. It extends a vine, thorned, bloodied. It It wants a piece of me, doesn't it? I can either take it or burn it. I mean, I don't want to burn the plant. Knowing this little about it, I'm scared of it, but... Elizabeth doesn't just destroy something just because they don't understand what it is, and it might be... Uh, malevolent? Let's take the vine. It flexes in front of you. The thorns dig into your flesh. The vine wraps around your arm. Your vision fades. Darkness. Silence. A heartbeat. Yours. The hour of deepest regrets. A midnight plant wraps its vines around you, its sharp thorns working deeper into your sleeping flesh. They lick at your mind, taste your memory, savor your pain. On distant vines, old griefs birth fresh flowers. Yeah, it's feeding on us, but not so much feeding on our body, like, you know, our, our flesh or anything like that, more feeding on our memories, on grief. Think of the monks below, think about Midnight's favor, or think about what it is offering. Why would a plant sell its leaves like this? Is it trying to enthrall people by making something that's so alluring and can bring it, uh, you know, bring the people to the midnight plant to be consumed? Think about midnight's favor. Why would a plant sell its leaves like this? There is value in pain. Midnight knows it intimately. They have been adversaries, comrades, master and apprentice. It's not clear which one is which, just that it flourishes in the plant's purple leaves. Not the pain of torment, the empathy of pain, distilled, shared, offering the liberation only the night can grow. Favor for those who might grow from it. Midnight's song to those who remain trapped in a cage of their own making. Think on the word liberation. Something is concealed behind that word. Wait, how exactly was liberation used? Offering the liberation only the night can grow. Think on the word liberation. A crusade for others to proselytize. But would it not be unethical for midnight to watch a man burn when it might so easily extinguish the flames? And what are the judgments, if not damned to burn brighter and longer than any in the, in the carrying out of their laws? The pain of a sun is a mighty engine. The liberation of night, isn't that the name of that cult? The one that tried to recruit Elizabeth so, so, so long ago? 
Hmm. So then, is this the basis for the liberation of night cult? This plant? Think about what it is offering. What brought you here in the first place? The echo of a kindred soul, perhaps. Midnight has seen much. You will see much more. There will be pain, but in the tongues of old, pain can be merely another word for alive. The vines ripe, uh, wrapped tight around your wrist have stretched across more worlds than most can count. They have seen that there are some that the universe breaks upon its anvil, and others on whom even the stars themselves may be shattered. For those, it has a different song. It's one that midnight might whisper into your ear in a place far from here, once you have fully seen what you are in the dark. Think of the monks below. Are they trapped here? They are free. They may leave if they wish. They simply choose life without suffering or remorse. As a chef puts a part of himself into every meal, so do they imbue the leaves they tend with their deepest regret. Midnight fills the void with its song. Oh, and that's what they were all humming. Think about letting go. Midnight's grip tightens around your mind. So few have heard its song. So many fewer have tasted its flavor, or favor, rather. It was not always so small. Its vines stretched across the stars themselves. They yearned to do so again. But the universe is slow, and people are so unpredictable. Should its disciples spread its call throughout the stars once more? Uh, uh, this is a lot of responsibility. So, I've had a good think about this. Elizabeth really cares about freedom and, and sovereignty and people being able to make their own choices so long as they're not coerced or forced. Everything I've seen from Midnight... Everything I've seen from Midnight suggests that it's not forcing anybody. I could be wrong. I don't know that much about it. But I chose to drink the tea myself. And now that it's kind of, uh, well, I guess basically gone inside of my body to communicate with me and show me things, it didn't, like, violently take me. Without consent, it reached out its thorny vines and offered its hand, basically. And I chose to take it. So, given that, I'm definitely not going to burn it. Uh, I'm going to say yes. Midnight should encourage the Bohemians to spread its tea. If people drink that tea and they like that experience and they want that, then okay. I gained an affiliation Bohemia and a searing enigma. Midnight's presence fades along with the light, your answer still hanging in the air. For a moment you fall into nothing, then there is a sharp pain and another one in your ribs. You open your eyes to find yourself lying outside the monastery gates. A pair of ringbreaker urchins prodding you with brooms. Huh. Told you they was alive. Owe me a chocolate ration, you do. Tomorrow's dawn. Hello? Oh, <laughs> the game just like froze for like five seconds. I wonder if I'm going to see any outcomes from making that choice. Or if that's something for far in the future for perhaps another captain or something to see. Okay, well, I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. So I hope you've enjoyed so far. And when I return, I'm going to do 
I mean, Jesus Christ, all these other things. I, did I just... Was that entire episode just visiting the court of tea and spices? I think it was. Yeah, pretty sure. So, when I return, we're gonna do a bunch of this other stuff. House of Silks, Vigilant Nightingale, Prominent Statue, Walk the Monastery, Head to the Marshes. 